Hi, welcome to the SAS Playbook. I'm Joe Floyd. Today we have special guest Kathy Lord, who is the SVP of Sales and Customer Success at Intact. So awesome. I'd like to throw it over to you to, to, to give a quick background on yourself and, sure. and, and maybe how you got to where you are. Absolutely. Uh, and so I have to actually say I studied ag business in college mm -hmm. and I was going to be a produce broker. Wow. And then I realized I got to live in really exciting places like Fresno and like <laughs> Stockton and like Davis and yeah. Salinas, which not that there's anything wrong with those places. I just didn't envision my life there. So I quickly uh, moved to the Bay Area yeah. and got sucked into technology. My first role was an SDR, so a sales development rep. Yep. And, Probably before uh, that was called that. Um, no, we were actually, yes, yeah, so it's true. We were called an inside sales rep then. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was with a company called Arbor Software. And uh, I had a phenomenal mentor there named Shelly um, Davenport, which is now Shelby, or Shelly Duvall, which is now Shelly Davenport. And she uh, sort of helped me launch my career into sales. So I started six months as an SDR, moved mm -hmm. into uh, more of a selling role. So they had some that were more appointment setters, some that yep. you were paired up with your field rep and you closed the smaller deals and they closed the bigger deals and uh, had this great turning point in my life where I wanted to go be a field sales rep. So I had the opportunity to do that and it was either uh, do that or go into management and manage a team of inside sales reps and the opportunity I had was in Austin. Mm -hmm. Now this is Austin 20 years ago yeah. when it was government college. Okay. Now 60 was still great but I was like I cannot picture myself living here in Austin. So I took the management job and nice. uh, so you stayed here. I stayed in California, took the management job and uh, got married. I did, like I got married, bought a house, got a whole new job all within like six months. Yeah, just compress all those life things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but with that did, and because I had such a great mentor, is it really accelerated my career into management. And I decided that I really loved working with people, managing mm -hmm. them, helping them perform. Yep. And so I uh, then went to go work for our VP of sales, uh, went to go to a startup, uh, a little company called Trading Dynamics, which was acquired by Ariba shortly after I joined, and ran a portion of their group for them, the Dynamic Trade Organization, which did online auction auctioning and RFPs, until about 2001, which this was uh, sort of pre-9-11, but 9-11 did not help the situation. Right. Uh, Ariba laid off 50% of their organization, and I was planning all the cuts I was making in my team, and that day came, and I was cut too. Uh, and so then went to a, this was sort of like, well, what type of company do I want to work for? What do I want to do? 2001 was not a great time. I remember it. And uh, what was really interesting is so I, I was like, well, I want to have some innovative technology because Arbor Software and Trading Dynamics and Ariba were very innovative. So I said, I, I want something that's disruptive. I really enjoy that. Yeah. And uh, went to a little startup, and uh, we're not going to mention the name of that particular one, but um, it was an Israeli company. And so other than the HR person, I was the only female. Okay, wow. And I quickly decided that that was probably not an enjoyable place to be. And um, then I moved to a couple of other startup companies and uh, ended up at a company called Proofpoint, which ultimately went public and is doing wildly well now uh, and uh, managed their inside sales organization. When my long lost mentor Shelly called me up and she said, I have this amazing opportunity and you have to come take advantage of this. And I'm like, I I'm happy, I'm not looking. Mm -hmm. She said, no, you really need to come check this out. So I did. And um, John Dillon, who uh, was our CEO at Arbor Software, original yep. CEO at Salesforce, obviously very connected with the emergence capital portfolio as well, was uh, on the board. Mm -hmm. And Emergence had just come in and recapitalized this company. And she said, you know, they're restarting the whole company. It's this great opportunity. There's not a bigger space than this. You got to come do this. So I, long story short, I went there. We were a couple million dollars in revenue. We're obviously multitudes beyond that now. Yeah. And um, really helped define how do we go to market? What do we do? And that was before SaaS was cool. Yeah. Uh, Wait, yeah. Is, is it cool now? <laughs> it is. So this is the worst, you know, talk about like war stories as a salesperson. So, you know, we're still trying to figure out how do we pitch this? What's the profile of rep do we mm -hmm. hire? What do we need to sell it? And nothing like being on a WebEx and you're trying to do a demo of a SaaS product 
and the prospect is on a 2400 baud modem and dial up. Yeah. Wondering why they can't see the screen. Yeah. And you're like, there's no way this customer can be successful. Yeah. Like, WebEx aside, yeah, yeah, <laughs> they yeah. can't run our app on yeah, dial up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, those were the early days of figuring out where we're at and what we do. See, and These are problems that YC kids will never have. Yes. <laughs> Real problems. <laughs> yes. That was my version of walking to school in the snow both That's ways uphill. Right. That's right. Um, and so what I think was really interesting about the tenure at uh, Intact and, and being there for 11 years in July is that um, it really was like, and it still is, working at three or four different companies because the different evolutions yeah. of the company and the different evolutions of the job. So it started out, I was managing, I think I had two SEs and maybe like three sales reps at the time. Yeah. Um, we were, you know, they had hired some people, fired some people, trying to figure out what the right model was. And we mm -hmm. decided we were gonna do this hybrid inside sales model. And from, you know, figuring out what verticals we focus on, how we go to market, building out a lead gen sales development team, building out a sales engineering organization, and once we actually acquired enough customers where we said, hey, you know what, we probably should think about what do we do to renew these customers? Yeah. Because in all honesty, like the first two years, I think it was like finance would just keep billing them. And we never really thought of a renewal or had a way to forecast it yeah. or, or like track it. What is our churn? Oh my yeah. gosh, what a novel concept. And um, about six, seven years ago, we decided that we really needed a dedicated customer success organization. This was clearly before customer success was cool. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, went through multiple iterations of how do we divide out hunters versus farmers. Yep. And, um, you know, started, built a whole program around that. So as sort of the organization evolved and the needs evolved of the organization, I got the opportunity to take on different roles and responsibilities. So came in as a VP of sales, but you know, then took on sales engineering, took on sales development, took on the customer success team. I actually had professional services and marketing for a point in time, but they took those away because they realized those were probably not a good idea. Yeah. Um, and so 11 years later almost, here I am today. Yeah, that's an amazing journey. Yeah. So there's, before we go into the intact stuff, and there's yeah. a wealth of information to talk about there, I noticed one thing in your background. I mean, it seems like having a mentor look out for your career who who basically was able to kind of pull you into a couple of different places and really look yeah. out for you was really critical. So what advice would you give to younger folks starting out in the Valley yeah. Uh, yeah. about that? And, and I would say that's... There's two pieces of advice that I've gotten along the way early in my career that I think helped accelerate the process. And the first one is, you know, surround yourself with really smart people mm -hmm. and pick one of those to be your mentor. And it should be somebody that regardless if you're working together or not, you know, 20 years later, I still talk to my mentor and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? We grab lunch and she's like, well, I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, you just, it's that trusted relationship of, you know, they can provide you that unbiased advice that family and friends can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, the second one is um, always look at hiring people better than yourself. And so you think about having a, you're surrounding yourself with smart people and having a mentor, but it's not just the people above you that you can learn from. Yeah. So if you're constantly hiring people better than yourself, smarter than yourself, it's going to help make you smarter and better. And I mean, it just amazes me. And we all complain about the millennials and you know how painful they are to manage and stuff, and how we don't understand them. But I have to say, I learned so much from the millennial generation we have in our organization. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's a whole different way to think about it. I thought oh, that's a really great idea. So now you're doing all your marketing through Snapchat? Is that what you've learned? No, 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 no. Not, not quite yet. Maybe next year. Okay. So let's, let's dive into Intact a little yeah. bit. Uh, when you got there, early days, how did you figure out what, my, what your sales model is going to be? What kinds yeah. of customers you're going to go after? Yeah. I mean, that's all Greenfield at that point. It, it was. And uh, so, you know, we were fortunate from the standpoint of at least the market we were targeting. I mean, like, they've just been accounting systems forever, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and before that, it was stone tablets and pokes and pens and stuff like that. But um, we were disrupting the space. And so we really had to think about where, you know, how have people historically been selling? And that was via the channel. Mm -hmm. um, but at that point in time, there was no SaaS companies that were selling through a channel. SaaS meant you were selling direct. Yeah. 
And frankly, none of the legacy VARs in our space would have even like given us the time of day to say like, what SaaS? And, and they assume SaaS means there's no implementation services. And of course, every VAR. So they don't want that. Yeah. yeah. And that's how they make their money. Like the license revenue is okay, but it's like services dollars is where it's at. Mm -hmm. And um, so we said, okay, well, you know, let's think about it. We're going to focus on North America. Um, we know we're focused on SMB, and we mm -hmm. weren't necessarily going after mid-market at the time. So we know we're targeting SMB. The only way to cost-effectively do that is via the phone and the web, because we can't afford to hire, you know, quarter-million-dollar sales guys, have them across the field, yeah. that are across the nation, that are used to doing, you know, two or three deals a year. Yeah. We need to be doing, like, you know, two to four deals a month. And so that sort of helped solidify the sales model. And then it was a matter of understanding what is the buyer's process in terms of what they need to go through and what their expectations are to understand what's the profile of sales rep we need to hire. So nobody's going to go buy an accounting ERP system without a demo. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's got unique requirements. So you got to do some form of discovery. So we said, okay, it can't be somebody selling IT widgets. And we did try that early on, and it was a turn wreck. <laughs> It's like, okay. Uh, so we kind of needed somebody who was used to selling, you know, complex business solutions, but that could do so at velocity. And it was a little bit of the purple squirrel trying to find these people, we yeah. realized. And so um, what we ultimately decided to do from a, a hiring of salespeople was let's find people who are good sales athletes that are smart from a business perspective, but may have zero domain expertise. Yeah. And we created a whole curriculum early on of what we called situational fluency that says, I take somebody who's a great sales athlete, you know, that has, you know, good, just general business acumen, and I teach them the day in the life of the finance organization and what they need to know. And so it's about a 24 hour course that they go through. And at the end of that, you know, they can have a discussion with the CFO. They're not going to know the details yeah. of the accounting, but they can have a sales rep level discussion. And so, once we sort of aligned with what the right profile of sales rep was and, and knew what sort of training we needed to augment them with, uh, we were able to significantly accelerate the hiring process. Um, and, and then obviously as the SaaS markets matured, it's really easy to find good velocity salespeople with yep. business experience. But the other key part of that was understanding, okay, we know what salespeople we need to have, but who are the customers we need to sell to? Mm -hmm. And um, as much as you would say, well, everybody needs accounting, but every industry does it different and has different requirements. Mm -hmm. And so we really had to narrow in and say, okay, so based on the product we have today, and when you start to look at the TAM or total addressable market, where should we invest? And so we prioritized um, two verticals that, and so it was like, or CTO and I sitting down saying, okay, I think the product is good here. I think it can do it here. We had a couple of early customers willing to be guinea pigs and partnered with them. And we ended up focusing on software and nonprofits and um, which for very different reasons were, were good initial targets. And uh, that really sort of launched the sales momentum we have today. And, you know, if you follow Jeffrey Moore and his bowling pin theory, you know, you take one bowling pin, yeah. knock it down and get the next and get the next and get the next. And so um, sort of really been rinsed and repeat of that. Yeah. So it's so you've talked about a little bit about how you identified the right profile of salesperson. Intact hasn't been a, a quick journey. It's been a long journey. Yes. So how do you focus on retaining the great people that you've hired and clearly you've invested to train and get up to speed in, yeah. in both the domain but also in how you sell. So how do you how do you think about their career development and how you retain them? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting how we sort of got to the structure that we have today. And so part of it did stem from this inability to find in the market the ready-made profile of reps that we wanted to hire. Um, because historically, you know, that it was also through the channel, or you had big enterprise whale hunters, and we needed something that was direct and in between. Yep. Uh, so we said, why not grow our own? <laughs> and so one of the great things about our CEO and the board was that they really believed, and this is part of why it took longer too, but uh, they believed in having a very efficient model. So you know, some of our, our competitors like just throw a ton of money on it and you know solve the problem that way and we said no we want to be highly efficient which is great in this wall street world today because we're already doing what they're looking for everybody to do 
But in terms of uh, setting the career path, we said, let's hire people as cheap as we can to do the front part of the sales process. So why would you have an expensive sales rep spend all their time prospecting? Because mm -hmm. frankly, none of them are very good at it. Right. So we said, let's develop the, let's really build out the sales development organization. And so in doing that, we said, well, you know, we can either hire people who are career SDRs and not to say they don't do great work, but they're not as motivated. Right. And how do I continue to grow and improve and, mm -hmm. and excel? And so we said, let's hire some college folks. And so we hired our first batch of, of college folks and um, we're like, gosh, you know, they're not on the phone so much. Why not? And so we worked in and, you know, we're trying everything we can and we realized they had never used an office phone before. They had only used their cell phone. They didn't even have a home phone, right? Yeah, yeah. Like who has a home phone anymore? And so we realized through all these trials and tribulations that yes, it is still a good idea, but there's this whole set of onboarding and training that has nothing to do with intact. That just has to do with how do you act the in basics. the office? You know, how to use a phone? I mean, they knew how to use most of the computer stuff. So, you know, learning Salesforce.com or Outlook was not that hard for them. But there was some very interesting things we had to teach them as, lo as well as you can't follow up on a lead and say, hey, I wanted to see what you guys just was thinking about a new accounting solution this year. Because we had a really cool one. I don't know if I'm a CFO, that just didn't resonate with me well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we're around with their whole vocabulary and, and those, those aspects as well. So we ultimately built out, we have a sales associate role, which are generally internships or part-time folks. So we'll pull from Santa Clara University, San Jose State, Berkeley, and uh, get folks either during the year or during the summer. Uh, many of those we've hired into our inbound sales development team. Mm -hmm. uh, we also then have an outbound sales development team in which they can graduate to. And so it kind of gives them a soft landing in which okay. to learn the basic skills. And then as they move into outbound, um, if they're successful, they have a couple of different paths they can go through. They can go to our customer success team, which is a farming role, and or they can go to our new business team. And the great thing we've done with those organizations is we have it broken out into market segments based on size. And so we have four segments uh, and they mirror each other. So we have a merging that is like less than 35 employees and it sort of graduates up from there. Yeah. But the emerging is a great place for these sales development folks to land and we've had folks move into both of those organizations and it's great to see that our number one rep right now came to us as an inbound SDR. Yeah, and just graduated. And graduated up. And the interesting thing that we're doing now is we are actually exploring giving them a path into sales engineering so folks that, because you, know, you don't know what you want to do like the year yeah. or two out of college. You know, they really like sales, but they're not quite sure they want to be that, you know, tiger out hunting new deals mm -hmm. or the farmer. And they really take a bend towards the product that we can have a career path up through sales engineering. And we're working on the same thing through sales enablement. And so it really gives people the ability to say, hey, you know, Intact's a great place to work. And how can I have, you know, a 10 year career yeah. there? Like, what would that look like? And yeah. Uh, it's proved really effective in retaining people. So do you do you sit down with somebody and you say this is what the path looks like? Do you kind of have like a yearly or six month check in where you kind of say this is the next tour of duty you can unlock if you perform well? Like how do you think about it? <laughs> so so one of the things we do and it's sort of a cultural thing there because we immediately think about this career development and path for the more junior folks in the organization, but it's equally applicable to people at the midpoint in their career. So. Yeah. I have career, I've already had three this week, but career counseling discussions with folks in my organization that, okay, how do I get your job to how do I get my first sales rep job? Yeah. And so it's helping folks at all level know that whether it's myself or our CEO, Rob Reed, that they can come in and say, okay, help me understand what are the paths available to yeah. me? Um, here's what I like and dislike. You know, What type of role do you think would be good? Because they don't know what it's like in those yeah. roles. and so. Just having very open and honest discussions available about what do you want to do and, and there's nothing wrong with reaching out and scheduling a coffee or lunch with another department head or a manager just to understand what's it like in your organization sure. as I'm exploring these things sort of at all levels. And where in many organizations it's sort of a taboo subject like, oh, don't go talk to somebody without my permission. We make that a very open and on the table discussion. And so we find that by doing that, those employees are also having those discussions with their managers. Yeah, makes total sense. Yeah. And so, so just give us a sense of, of context. So how big is the sales organization and what would you say 
if you had a retention metric, like how do you how do you think about it? What sure, absolutely. So in my organization today, uh, I have about 120 people, and that's broken across uh, about 30 new business reps, 20 farmers. We've got 15 sales engineers. We've got 30 SDRs. Mm -hmm. Uh, you layer in some management there and some support and auxiliary roles. And um, I would say that uh, we probably have a uh, 85 to 90% tension rate. Because like, all honesty, we don't hire perfect all the time. So there are some people we hire where we go, oh my God. Yeah, so I guess uh, they go, oh my God. Unwanted, <laughs> unwanted attrition is yeah. the... Yeah, so, so unwanted attrition, it's probably less than 5%. Yeah, and so that's probably one of the keys to yeah. intact success is just keeping that talent in-house. Yes, it is. That's fantastic. So I want to switch gears to one last topic. Yeah. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to say it, but I was when I was doing some research, I noticed that you're one of the only female execs yeah. at, at Intact. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about what are some of the things that you have to do to succeed in that in that environment, uh, and also what are some advice you might have for, for other folks in the same position? No, absolutely. And we now have two execs, so we did hire a general counsel who's that's, female as well, and she's she's a pretty sharp cookie. Um, so it's, it's challenging, and I mentioned early on my foray into an Israeli, all-Israeli company where I was the only female. Yeah. And certainly that is a very uncomfortable experience, and as much as I said, oh gosh, I'm never going to do that again, at the same time, sometimes you learn from those. And so what I did learn is that, you know, you have to embrace being a woman. You can't say, oh, I'm going to try to be a man. I'm going to be their pal. I'm going to, I'm going to go to all the Warriors games, too. I'm going to yeah. go to the Stanford basketball. I'm going to... You have to figure out, you know, as a woman, how do you get the same amount of time with the CEO or with a board member, right? So, um, you know, how can you portray yourself as just as confident, just as capable as any of your male counterparts? And what I've found is that if you just come to the table prepared with a good opinion and not afraid to voice what you think and what you feel, you will be there. You don't have to try to play the game the same way that your male counterparts do. And it's a really hard thing not to get sucked into. And I see a lot of my, my peers do that. And, and even some of the uh, senior managers that I have that I catch doing that, I say, you know, you, you don't have to try to be one of the guys. Right. Be just who you are, and if you're good at what you do, that's going to come through. Yeah. You need to be willing to be your own advocate, yep. because nobody's going to be your advocate for you. And that's regardless of if you're a man or a woman. Yep, that makes and, sense. And uh, that's really helped. Yep. And so, how do you think we as investors or as executives can help uh, kind of fill the diversity gap that we're, that we're seeing. Absolutely. And so, uh, and I'm going to pick on somebody here for a moment, but, uh, so I was recently at, at Saster and so that's Jason Lemkin's yep. event, right? And, um, it was very interesting. I, uh, I did a panel there with Salesforce and we happened to have a woman who was a moderator, but by and large, every session I went to, when I walked around, I mean, I felt like, you know, one of a dozen women at the event. Mm -hmm. And so part of, you know, setting up an environment where women feel comfortable that they are welcome, that they can succeed, is not making, you know, whether it's an event like Saster, whether it's, and I love the Saster event, by the way, so I'm not trying to do anything negative for, for Jason on that. But, you know, if it's set up and all the activities and everything, it's like it's a good old boys club, mm -hmm. it's not going to be welcoming and inviting to women. So if it's... You know, all about, you know, drinking at the bar, having whiskey, even this. Okay, that may not be what's going to get the diversity of people thinking, culture, gender, et cetera, that is important. And I see that just even in interacting and, you know, I deal with a lot of our customers, boards and senior executives. And, you know, those that have environments that are, you know, whether it's the social activities, the way they conduct meetings or what they do, that is thoughtful and open to making all folks feel comfortable it invites them to want to participate to feel comfortable participating that they are going to be acknowledged and valued and uh it's hard to do yeah you know and I, i'm actually even with my sales managers constantly saying this is not a boys locker room this is not okay conversation this is not how we need to go run and do stuff and they'll go yeah you're right you're right but there's just a lot of i think 
built-in sort of cultural habits and expectations that we have to sort of break through to just say, hey, should be equal opportunity for all of us. We just come to the problems and, and the way we approach them, just very different way of thinking. And one's not better than the other, they're different. And if you take the two differences, put them together, you're going to get something better at the end. 100% agree, and I'm glad that you're leading the way uh, to make Silicon Valley better. <laughs> so I appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So thank you very much for, for coming in. I really appreciate you sharing yeah, with us. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for everyone watching. Yeah, thank you.